source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. British Columbia lies on the picturesque west coast of Canada. Famous for its natural beauty, it has become infamous for its flourishing marijuana industry. Through the heart of the province runs the mighty Fraser River, which refused to be an accomplice in this complex investigation rooted in a marijuana grow operation. On June 17, 1994, the captain of a tugboat on the Fraser River makes a grisly discovery. He immediately moors his load and calls the police. I received information that uh, an individual had been tangled up in a log boom on the Fraser River. And that log boom had subsequently been dragged across the Fraser River to the Langley side off the river. The area where the body was landed is an area called Darby Reach. And it's actually a provincial park. And there's a, a slight, small, sandy area. The body was uh, recovered from that point, uh, I believe, with the assistance of the uh, fire department. Royal Canadian Mounted Police Corporal Gil Campbell arrives on the scene and makes another surprising discovery. When I saw the body with the duct tape wrapped from the chin to just below the eyes, uh, there was no doubt in my mind that uh, this individual uh, certainly didn't commit suicide by leaving all his clothes on and wrapping his head in duct tape and uh, jumping off a bridge or what have you. There would be approximately uh, 20 feet uh, of duct tape around the head. It appeared the body had been in the Fraser River for some time. There was some deterioration throughout the body. Investigators don't find any identification, scars, tattoos, or distinguishing marks on the body. So the victim is classified as unidentified human remains until more information is found. The identification process is very rigorous and must be foolproof. We don't ever use um, legal or um, government-issued ID to identify someone. It, it could be a lead, but we would never look at a driver's license and say, this is the person. We need to have a bona fide identification by someone who knows this individual, especially if someone's in their late teens, but not quite 19. Um, there's a chance someone may have fake ID on them that closely resembles them, but isn't them. Um, that can take the investigation into a very uneventful direction. And you also run the risk on a personal level of notifying family of a death that hasn't actually occurred. The victim was taken to the New Westminster morgue and the investigation continued in an attempt to identify the individual. Gil Campbell has yet to learn that two days prior to the discovery of the body, RCMP received a call reporting the disappearance of an individual named Timothy Langmead. The family had not heard from uh, this individual for approximately one week, which they felt was unusual. The family believed, actually, he was living in a basement suite in Maple Ridge. All they had was a cell telephone number for him, and we subsequently did a subscriber check and found that the subscriber for that telephone actually lived uh, on Prairie Avenue in Port Coquitlam. The investigators go to Langmead's cell phone billing address in a suburb of Vancouver. There was no vehicle around at all that Mr. Langmead might have driven, and they tried the front door and found it to be unlocked. The odor of uh, marijuana was quite evident. The police cannot legally enter the house without permission. 
So the RCMP request a search warrant on the grounds that the Prairie Avenue house in Port Coquitlam is a marijuana grow up. Meanwhile, the autopsy on the unidentified body proceeds. The pathologist starts by removing the duct tape that has been wrapped around the victim's head. It measures an astonishing seven meters. The pathologist reports that the tape surrounding Langmead's head appeared to have shifted upwards after death. This is probably a result of river currents and the loosening of the skin on the deceased's head, which was due to prolonged immersion in the Fraser River. The pathologist formed this opinion because of the marked difference in the lividity on the skin around the victim's chin. A body floating in water tends to float face down so blood accumulates by force of gravity in the tissues on the frontal portion of the body. This causes a discoloration known as lividity. Because the body was immersed for many days, lifting fingerprints from the remains proves challenging. To accomplish this, the forensic identification technician injects a saline solution beneath the surface of the skin. The fluid inflates the wrinkled skin to allow prints to be made. The pathologist reported damage to the liver and spleen, as well as pooling of several hundred cc's of blood in the abdomen. However, the pathologist could not determine if the injuries happened pre or post-mortem. Well, there were no visible external injuries on examination, and I know that he had sustained a number of lacerations to vital organs in his abdominal area. The pathologists and the other investigators also uh, are able to determine with accuracy if an injury was sustained before the person died or if they're, again, if they're in the Fraser River in a waterway where there's a lot of traffic, I mean, they're going to be, com they're going to be constantly experiencing post-mortem trauma. The investigation into the disappearance of Timothy Langmead continues. The RCMP discover that in addition to the house in Port Coquitlam, Langmead also has an apartment in Vancouver. We suspected the individual might be our missing person that had been reported a week earlier. So we went to uh, Vancouver, uh, took various items like beer bottles, CDs, located fingerprints and matched them up with the uh, fingerprints that we had recovered uh, from the victim. The fingerprints from the unidentified remains and those collected from the apartment in Vancouver are a match. The victim is definitely Timothy Langmead. With the autopsy complete, the pathologist reports the victim died of asphyxiation or being deprived of air. It was not possible to determine if the cause was strangulation or drowning. A drowning death is in fact an asphyxial death, so the cause of death was determined to be asphyxia, but just on the, the circumstances of the case and the pathologist couldn't determine whether it was the asphyxial component of the tape itself or if it was immersion in the water. There was some evidence to suggest that Mr. Langmead was alive when he entered the water, so he determined that uh, there were two factors in the asphyxial death, which was the tape and the water. The investigators return to Langmead's house in Port Coquitlam. They come prepared to put another suspected grow operation out of business. They quickly locate the source. But they are also looking for clues that will explain Langmead's demise. They subsequently obtained a search warrant under the Narcotic Control Act, came back and found approximately 1,000 plants in the basement of this residence. The illegal cultivation of marijuana in British Columbia is a huge underground industry, estimated to be several billion dollars. 
The RCMP are accustomed to this kind of discovery, and they follow procedure. They would have dismantled the entire operation, including plants, lighting, and, and whatever. Uh, that would be all taken back to the Coquitlam detachment and logged in as exhibits. As for clues that would explain the death of Timothy Langmead. There was nothing else in the residence or nothing out of the ordinary other than the fact the basement had been an entire grow up. It definitely looked like someone was living there. From the neighborhood inquiries, it indicated that uh, Mr. Langweed was the one living there. While the grow-up is being dismantled, police canvass the neighborhood, searching for more information. We learned that one of the neighbors had observed a Mercedes vehicle attend at the residence on Prairie Avenue several times a week. And this neighbor happened to take down the license plate number of the Mercedes. And as a result of that, we followed up, found out who the registered owner was. Alan Gordon was the name of the individual that attended several times each week uh, in the Mercedes. Alan Cash Gordon is well known to police. He has a record for drug-related crimes and is currently on parole. The parole officer issued a warrant for his immediate arrest as they were concerned that he might be involved in a grow operation on the, at the Prairie Avenue residence. As a result of that, we arrested him. Investigators interview Cash Gordon at the Coquitlam RCMP detachment. He admits knowing Timothy Langmead, but maintains that he only knows him as a gardener who has done landscaping for him. His uh, story was that uh, he sold his information on how to set up grow ops to individuals, but he personally had no involvement in the Prairie Avenue grow op, other than the fact he would visit Timothy Langmead as a friend. Mr. Gordon had indicated that the only person who might have known about the grow-up was um, Mr. Riley. Cash Gordon suggests that the police talk to Barry Riley, who lives in the small town of Lytton, British Columbia, a three-hour drive from the Porco Coquitlam house. Gordon explains Riley was involved in the setup of the electrical system at the Prairie Avenue grow-up. Before police have a chance to talk with Barry Riley, a dramatic event completely changes the course of the investigation. That around the 20th or 21st of June, the residence on Prairie Avenue was torched. There was an arson, and it was confirmed there were three uh, hot spots that indicated a fire had been set at the residence. Corporal Campbell and his team realized this is a turning point in their investigation. The question on everyone's mind is simple. Who benefits from burning down a house that has already been busted? And more importantly, why? In June 1994, the RCMP are investigating two seemingly unrelated cases. The missing persons case of Timothy Langmead, a landscape gardener with no priors and an unidentified body found tangled in a log boom on the Fraser River. Fingerprints confirm the body pulled from the Fraser River is that of Timothy Langmead. His phone records lead the investigators to one of his residences, which doubled as a marijuana grow operation. A few days after the Porco Coquitlam grow up is dismantled by the RCMP, the house was destroyed by arson. One hundred and ninety kilometers northeast of Port Coquitlam is a spectacular canyon on the Fraser River called Hell's Gate. 
three weeks after Timothy Langmead's body was discovered, a van was found clinging to the cliff north of Hell's Gate. There are no license plates on the vehicle, but police are still able to trace the owner. Through the VIN number on the vehicle, we identified it as being Tim Langmead's. It was found by a tourist who was taking photographs who had gone to the edge of the, uh, the cliff drop and he looked down and saw the, uh, the van uh, approximately 200 feet down the cliff. We used a tow truck with a long line and uh, basically the van was uh, pulled up from that location and uh, towed uh, eventually to the Coquitlam RCMP detachment for further investigation by our forensic units. Someone had tried to start a fire inside the van, but obviously uh, on its tumble down the cliff, uh, the fire had gone out. Unfortunately for the investigators, very little usable evidence is found. However, the forensic identification officers keep at it and their persistence finally pays off. There was a piece of paper recovered from the van and it appeared it was Barry Riley's uh, pager number. Corporal Gil Campbell now has another reason to question Barry Riley. He and his partner set out for Lytton, 55 kilometers north of Hell's Gate, where Riley is living. And we arranged to meet him at the uh, Lytton RCMP detachment on the 27th of July, 1994. And he was a person of interest at that time because his name had been given to us by Gordon and we intended on finding out what his relationship was with regards to Timothy Langmead and the residents on Prairie Avenue. Police already know that Barry Riley has unusual family circumstances. His father was a serving member of the RCMP at that time, and the lady that was attached with his father, she was also a member of the drug squad for the RCMP. His mother was cohabitating with another member uh, of the RCMP who was currently on duty at that time uh, with the Lytton Detachment RCMP. Riley is informed that the conversation will be recorded. We really did want to find out what was the uh, relationship with Timothy Langmead and Cash Gordon, because we had other stories as to what his involvement was, so we wanted his side of it because there was certainly no criminal evidence available at, the, at that time. I think he knew that uh, when we had mentioned uh, Kesh Gordon, he obviously realized that uh, Mr. Gordon had told us information about him, that he worked for Mr. Gordon on another grow up, that he set up the grow up on Prairie. That information would only have come from Kesh Gordon. It is clear to Corporal Campbell that Riley is well aware of the RCMP's investigation techniques because of his family background. He obviously felt that he might as well come clean on the drugs because we certainly, with his admission, couldn't charge him for anything drug-related anyway, uh, and he just wanted to distance himself from any uh, homicide. He indicated uh, he had worked for Kesh Gordon. Uh, as a matter of fact, Prior to the Prairie grow up, he was looking after another grow up for Mr. Gordon. I think the reason he gave us the information was to certainly say, look, he's not an angel, and this is what I do, but I'm not, I don't murder people. Riley admits that he did the electrical installation at the Prairie Avenue grow up. He also says that he had never been paid for his work. According to Riley, the statement he gave to the police, sometime shortly after the 8th of June, Gordon had driven up to Lytton to contact Riley. Kesh Gordon had threatened him with physical violence. 
Gordon told him that he has friends with guns, so if he's ripping them off, he better beware. And secondly, he said that Gordon's prints, as well as Riley's prints, would probably be on in the residence on Prairie, and he would have to try and get rid of them. And of course, we know that the uh, later that month, the month of June, the residence is torched. Uh, the arson was investigated, and uh, at that time, and even subsequently, uh, no one was uh, arrested and charged. Although the RCMP have two suspects who could have set fire to the grow up on Prairie Avenue, there is not enough evidence to lay charges. The police decide to give priority to the Langmead investigation. After hours of interrogation, Campbell doesn't believe that Riley has told him everything. With no other leads to follow, the RCMP decide to launch a public appeal in the lower mainland of British Columbia. They ask people to call a tips line, hoping to get new information. We received a tip from an individual stating that three individuals were involved and gave us pertinent details regarding uh, why they went down to uh, Port Coquitlam and what they did. There's information we received from the tipster that only a person who, who was involved would have known. The anonymous tip reveals three individuals in question. David Henry, Barry Riley, and a minor. They all live in Lytton. The investigators are aware that Barry Riley is familiar with their techniques and is cautious of their questioning. Can Gil Campbell and his team find a way to get Riley to make an unwitting admission? In June 1994, the body of Timothy Langmead is found tangled in a Fraser River log boom. Investigators discovered that Langmead was the gardener of a marijuana grow up that was robbed and later burned down. The murderer is still at large. The RCMP have three main suspects, Barry Riley, David Henry, and a minor. RCMP Corporal Gil Campbell decides to set up an undercover operation. He wants to get Barry Riley to disclose what happened with Timothy Langmead and to implicate his accomplices. Investigators put together a brief of all the evidence they have so far about Langmead, his relationship with the suspects, and the poor Coquitlam grow up. The way it is with most of these grow ups is that uh, they'll hire someone who's unsuspecting to the public, and at the same time, usually that individual is quite well paid and their job is basically to live at the residence and uh, make sure the plants grow and do not discuss what he does or what's going on at the residence with anyone. Timothy Langmead's role at the Prairie Avenue residence was strictly as a gardener. His background was a gardener. On any given day, uh, Mr. Langmead would have had to make sure that the plants were getting enough water, also getting enough heat from the heat lamps. As I recall, they were getting about four crops a year, the way they had the uh, plants staggered. And uh, of course, once each section of the grow up was harvested, uh, they would be responsible for cutting it up and bagging it and uh, eventually getting rid of it. The RCMP undercover operation is ready to target their first suspect, Barry Riley. Corporal Gil Campbell warns the undercover officers about the added challenge of this covert operation. 
Barry Riley came from a, a police-oriented family, and uh, there was concerns that he might be savvy to police techniques in areas of investigation and interrogation. After considering various options, we decided to run with the uh, undercover operation, with the target initially being Barry Riley. The undercover team reserves a motel room. They set up hidden cameras, microphones, and recording equipment. They will invite Riley and try to get him to admit his role in the murder of Langmead. Depending on the type of case that we're working on, will really dictate the, uh, the type of um, uh, covert equipment we'll use, uh, both audio or video. When we initially assess the case, if we know that um, uh, it's fairly sensitive and the individuals may be suspicious, then we'll tie it into, um, build it into a pair of glasses, to uh, a brooch on somebody's lapel, to um, watches, pens, belt buckle, hearing aid, cell phone, pretty much anything that you can imagine. If we can actually wire a, uh, a location um, in advance prior to conducting a sting, then we can use uh, things that will blend into that home or office or whatever the location is. We can use things like clocks, clock radios, uh, little portable radios, um, motion sensors that uh, are tied into an existing alarm system, alarm panels. Uh, we've uh, built them into carbon monoxide testers and um, uh, smoke detectors. The undercover officers meticulously prepare for their encounter with Barry Riley. When we look at the, the subject and we get a good understanding of what they do, where they go, who they associate with, everything about them, get them to the point where the investigator knows them as if that they're their best friend. They study all of their movements, habits, things that they like, dislikes, you name it. It's important because you need to be able to not just fit in, but you need to be able to anticipate those potential surprises that are going to catch you off guard. And that fraction of a moment can make or break your case. If your cover is blown, your investigation's over, and all of that work that you've put towards you know, getting yourself into that situation is gone. The undercover officers convince Barry Riley to meet with them for a chat in the motel room, wired with covert recording equipment. I believe this was um, late September, early October, 1994. Mr. Riley was uh, suspicious of the two undercover operators. In fact, indicated to them that he believed they were either bikers or police, and either way, he didn't want to associate with them. When a subject has been heated up or is suspicious of any type of investigation around them, it definitely becomes a lot more challenging. The undercover operation with Riley is abandoned. If there is a situation where you know that they're going to be expecting an, an investigator or an operative, then we'll, we'll double up on our investigation. We'll create two stings instead of one. And the first one is the initial attempt to uh, develop the relationship with the subject. And the second one is just hovering in the background, allowing or waiting for opportunity for the subject to draw us in. Two months later, the RCMP moved forward with phase two of the undercover operation. This time, their target is David Henry. To be consistent, the undercover officers use the same story as they did with Riley. They claim to be gang members. He was actually bragging to the undercover operators to show them how bad he was or how mean he was. Of course, and as time continued and his contact with the undercover operators continued, he came around and told uh, more a story of what we believe occurred. Contrary to his friend Barry Riley, David Henry is a more cooperative subject. He is completely unguarded and unaware that his conversation is being videotaped. After several drinks, 
he tells them about the events of June 8, 1994. The undercover agents record Henry saying that he and Riley went down to a man's grow op to steal his money. Riley knew him because he had set up the electrical. Henry boasts that they entered the grow op and he beat the man in the legs with a steel bar before strangling him with his bare hands. Henry adds that Riley stole $6,000 that was hidden inside a wall, but left the marijuana behind. He also says that he and Riley hogtied the man and drove him up to Hell's Gate in his own van. Wanting to impress the undercover officers, Henry tells them that they stabbed the man's stomach and chest with a knife so he would not float. Then he tied the spare tire to the body and with Riley's help, threw him into the Fraser River from the Alexandra Bridge at Hell's Gate along the highway to Lytton. The undercover officers asked David Henry if the body was recovered. He boasts about reading it in the paper and thinking it was cool because he knew they were responsible. When asked what happened to the van, Henry describes pushing it over a cliff into Hell's Gate. The undercover officers decide to move to the next phase of the operation. They must apply for a warrant to target Barry Riley once more. They decide to keep David Henry with them until the warrant is granted. That way, they keep him from contacting Riley, which could risk spoiling their plans. Henry is eager to spend time with the men he believes to be real gang members. He hopes to impress them and to be recruited into their organization. The undercover operators had Mr. Henry with them for about four or five days which I believe was unknown to uh, Mr. Riley. They want Henry to make contact with Barry Riley and lure him into a meeting. Henry tells them that Riley has moved to Kamloops, British Columbia. So it was set up through warrants that we would do the same thing again, audio and video, and that Mr. Henry would call Mr. Riley, come over and have a few beers. I believe it was around the 7th of January of 1995. If we have a, uh, a subject that's somewhat heated up or, or suspecting, uh, you know, some type of surveillance to be done, then we will utilize several, several vehicles. We'll switch them up. We'll make sure that one really stands out. We'll make it seem like they're burnt and we'll have already anticipated their entire routine. Unaware that his friend David Henry is accompanied by the same two undercover officers, Riley agrees to join Henry. Riley realized that Mr. Henry was with the undercover operators, the, the individuals who had targeted him in September, early October. Riley is very reluctant to speak, and one of the undercover operators has a bit of an, an argument with him. If one listens to the transcript, what happens is Mr. Riley disclosing his involvement and confirming what David Henry had told to the uh, undercover operators. Realizing that they probably have the confessions they were looking for, the officers decide to leave Henry and Riley alone for a few minutes while the cameras are still rolling. There was a time during this undercover operation in Kamloops when Mr. Riley and Mr. Henry were alone. Riley is heard telling Henry that he doesn't trust these guys or something to that effect. Will the confessions obtained by the undercover officers be sufficient to arrest Barry Riley and David Henry? Is there enough evidence to find them guilty of murder? June 1994, the body of Timothy Langmead is pulled from the Fraser River. The prime suspects are Barry Riley and David Henry. Investigators work for seven months to build a case for murder. The RCMP use an undercover operation to obtain confessions that seal their case against the suspects. The undercover operation is successful. 
the prosecution has enough evidence to arrest three suspects for the murder of Timothy Langmead. Barry Riley, David Henry, and their young accomplice are arrested on the charge of second-degree murder. The suspects are interrogated separately. Investigators are looking for more details to corroborate the statements recorded in the undercover operation. They begin with Barry Riley. Myself and another investigator went in and spoke with him, and he subsequently admitted to his involvement. Barry Riley knew Kesh Gordon for some time. He had worked for him months earlier. He had been hired by Kesh Gordon to do the electrical work and set up the grow up on Prairie. At that time, he was looking after his own grow up in another residence in Port Coquitlam. Barry Riley resented Kesh Gordon for not having paid him for the work he had done on Prairie Avenue. That's what motivated Riley to rob the grow up that Langmead was managing. Mr. Riley, it appeared, was the main person in this uh, operation, and it's our understanding that it was his idea to take his two friends with him to go down to the Lower Mainland to rip off uh, the GROW operation. During a party in Lytton, Riley convinces his friends to help him rip off the Prairie Avenue GROW op. They borrow a car, and from Lytton, the diabolical events are set into motion on June 8th, 1994. The grow up is in Port Coquitlam, a three hour drive south of Lytton. The men drink beer and rum heavily during the trip. Barry Riley knows that the grow up is probably guarded by Timothy Langmead. In anticipation of a fight with Langmead, they bring duct tape and rope in case they need to subdue him. They arrive at the Prairie Avenue house, but see no signs of Timothy Langmead. Riley and Henry manage to break in and enter the grow up. Riley sends Henry and the young accomplice downstairs to harvest the marijuana while he looks for cash. The investigation indicated that uh, this was a strictly a grow up rip, and they had gone down uh, with the intentions of getting some free marijuana Unfortunately, as things turned out, Mr. Langmead came home while they were still at the door. Langmead immediately realizes what is happening. The discussion quickly turns to a fight. They subsequently tied Mr. Langmead up to a chair in the kitchen because he was shouting, and it wouldn't be quiet, they subsequently put duct tape around him. Henry tapes Langmead's mouth shut. Riley goes to the basement to help steal the marijuana. David Henry is left alone with Langmead. I believe it was Mr. Henry that put the, the duct tape around the victim's uh, head. Riley returns a few minutes later. He finds Langmead tied to the chair, lying on the floor. Henry had completely wrapped Langmead's head with duct tape. He is not breathing. The men do not panic when they realize they have killed Langmead. They systematically finish stealing the rest of the mature marijuana plants. They cut as much as they could, loaded it in the victim's van. And they also took the victim and pushed him in the back of the van as well. They also took the victim's guitar, which was subsequently recovered from another individual in Lytton. And uh, there was a VCR as well that was taken. They drove back to Lytton with the victim in his own van. 
the first order of business is to dispose of Langmead's body and his vehicle. The road back to Lytton offers the men many opportunities to do so. Riley pulls off the road near the Alexandra Bridge, an old abandoned bridge that crosses the Fraser River near Hell's Gate. The license plates are removed from the van while Riley and Henry dispose of Langmead's body. They throw the body over the Alexander Bridge. And then they took the van, took all the marijuana out of the van, and just a couple of miles north of there, north of Hell's Gate, and then they dumped it over the cliff. The men then return to Lytton, confident that their crime will never be discovered. The police know that in the days following their return to Lytton, the accused quickly found buyers for the drugs they had stolen. After 10 months, the RCMP has gathered evidence and successfully completed a complex undercover operation to build a strong case. Will it be enough for the prosecutor to convict Barry Riley, David Henry, and the young accomplice for the murder of Timothy Langmead? Thanks to the RCMP undercover operation, Barry Riley and David Henry confessed to the murder of Timothy Langmead on June 8, 1994. The recorded confessions of the two defendants explain in detail how they beat him, wrapped his head in seven meters of duct tape, and threw his body into the Fraser River. Finally, with the strength of the prosecutor's case and witness testimony, the charges against the accused are upgraded. After the swearing of the charges, which would be um, sometime in January of 1995, the charges were bumped up to first degree. And that was because of the fact when you can find someone uh, against their will, it becomes automatically a first degree offense. The prosecutor decides there is not enough evidence against the young offender. The charges against him are stayed, and he is released. The trial of Barry Riley and David Henry continues. One of the first witnesses brought to the stand by the prosecutor is none other than Cash Gordon. Mr. Gordon actually attended as a witness for the prosecution. And his uh, story was that he sold his information on how to set up grow ops to individuals, but he personally had no uh, involvement in the Prairie Avenue uh, grow op, other than the fact he would visit Timothy Langmead as a friend. The trial lasts several weeks. The jury delivers a guilty verdict without hesitation. Barry Riley and David Henry are currently serving 22-year prison sentences. On three occasions between 1995 and 2010, Barry Riley and David Henry attempt to appeal their sentences, citing a variety of reasons. On each occasion, the original first-degree murder conviction is upheld, and the two criminals must continue to serve their prison sentences. The arson of the grow up on Prairie Avenue in the center of this story has never been solved. But the police suspect that the arsonist can be found among the individuals involved in the grow up. The perpetrators thought by throwing the body into the watery gate of hell, it would disappear forever and that they could go on with their lives. Instead, the river spit out the evidence of their crime and their own lives changed forever. But once again, 
What could have remained an unpunished crime, drowned in the raging waters of Hell's Gate, turned out quite different thanks to the unpredictable nature of water.